start with our first lesson this year in Algebra 2. And this, for the most part, is going to be a review for all of you on understanding how to solve linear equations. So we're going to first start talking about some language. So in an algebraic, an algebraic expression, we need to understand some of the words. So most of this is going to be a little bit of a review for you. So when I look at these, this language here, it says write an algebraic expression to represent what 7 less than a number means. Now, we understand that less usually means take away or subtraction. But when they put in that extra word less than, it really means that we're going to need to take 7 from some arbitrary number. So we're going to call that number n and then we're going to write an expression where we have n, maybe n is 10, and we take 7 away from 10. That gives us the algebraic expression for 7 less than a number. Our second example says we're looking for the square of a number and then we're going to decrease that by the product of 5 in a number. So we got a lot of mathematical language in there, so let me start at the beginning. The square of a number looks like n squared. Now do I always need to use n? No, I can use x, I can use a, I can use y. For now I'm going to let that number be represented by n. So I have the square of a number decreased by that's going to tell me I'm going to subtract something from it. And what do I want to subtract from it? The product of 5 in the number. So that's going to give me n squared minus 5n. These are algebraic expressions. Now we're going to use equations in a little bit. An equation would include having some kind of equal sign to it. So maybe Part B says the square of a number decreased by the product of 5 in a number is 12, maybe if that was added. So how I would add to that expression now with the is 12, that turns that expression into an equation and now that would be solvable for us. All right, let's look at that third example. It says 6 times the difference of a number and 3. So here are some keywords. You see that I always either underline or I circle my key mathematical terms. So I have 6 times the difference. So I also have another subtraction problem. But this, the difference with this is, because it says the difference of a number and 3, I need to do this part first. So the difference of a number and 3 is going to be n minus 3, but I need to take all of that times 6. So I'm going to put that 6 on the outside and I'm going to use my grouping symbols to show that that difference has to occur first of n minus 3. So that gives us our expression 6 times the quantity of n minus 3. Alright, so now we got through a little bit of language review Let's talk about how we can tie this to equations. So with equations, I gave a kind of a real world example. So it says write down the directions on how you would dress yourself. So in the morning you're getting dressed and we know we wear different things. But if I make kind of a generic outfit, we're going to wear shirts and a pants and our undergarments, socks and shoes. If I have that type of an outfit for today, and I ask you the right, to write down the directions on how you would dress yourself. Well, first of all, we would all start with putting on our undergarments because that's our bottom layer. So that obviously has to go on first. After that, now this is where we get a little bit of options in there. For some of us, we'll, after our, our undergarments, we'll put on our shirts and then we'll put on our pants. But for others, they might put on their pants and then their shirt. So there's a little bit of a leeway in there as to what order you do those middle things in. 
All right, but after, after we get our shirts and our pants on, then typically we'll put on our socks. Again, that might be an optional item for some of us. Some of us might choose not to wear socks that day. But after we put on our socks, we conclude our outfit with some shoes. All right, so now that we're dressed, think of getting ourselves dressed as building that expression that we did back here. So over here, we're building the expressions with the mathematical operations of less than and times and squaring numbers. All right, now, when we have to go back and solve for these variables, if I'm looking at this equation right here and I want to solve for n, what I have to do is peel off the layers. I have to peel off the operations, but I have to do them backwards. Just like at the end of the day, when I get undressed, I wouldn't be able to take my undergarments off first. When I get undressed, I'm going to start with taking off my shoes first. That's probably one of the first things I do when I get home. After that, then I probably would get rid of those socks. Now again, step three and four are going to have options. Maybe you take your pants and then your shirt. Maybe you take your shirt and then your pants off. So this might look different for all of us. Oop. That's the right shirt on there. And then... The last thing I'm going to do is take off my undergarments. So you can see that this is the exact opposite. How I got undressed is the exact opposite, but again, we have some options in the middle of how we got dressed. That's what we do when we solve an equation. Now, when we built those expressions earlier on, we used order of operations. Now you might remember this in Algebra 1 and pre-algebra as please excuse my dear Aunt Sally. You might also remember this as remembering that shortcut of saying calling it PEMDAS. PEMDAS reminds us that our first operations has to be parentheses but remembering that parentheses could be brackets, it could be the fraction bar. You're, it's going to include all of our grouping symbols. I don't know why they didn't call it GEMDAS, but it's PEMDAS. Our second order of operation, one of our most important, is to do exponents second. So we do all of our grouping symbols, we simplify our exponents, and our third, you can see that I only have four steps. Because multiplication and division actually falls under the same step. Multiplication and division gets done in order from left to right. So this is kind of the steps if I go back to the analogy of getting dressed. You might put your shirt and then pants on. I might put my pants and then my shirt on. This has a little leeway, but our order in our operation should go left to right. Same thing with step four, which is addition and subtraction. You're going to do those. That they mean almost the same thing, so they're this, this, at the same level of our order of operations. So you're going to look at doing those left or right. Now, that's what we learned in pre-algebra. In algebra, when we start learning how to solve what that variable actually means, we undo the order of operations. So when I undo the order of operations, I'm going to start with undoing addition and subtraction first. So get rid of all the addition and subtraction that are not tied in your grouping symbols. If it's in your grouping symbols, then you have to wait for that and do that last. The second thing you're going to undo is all your multiplication and division. Then third is undoing your exponents. And last, if you have any left, you need to undo any operation that showed up within those grouping symbols. So you can see that when we do our order of operations and when we solve an equation, 
they are the exact opposite of one another. Again, you'll have those steps where you might have a little bit of a leeway as to if you have multiple operations, you can pick and choose what you do first. But you always should start with any addition, subtraction, undo your multiplication and division, undo your exponents, and undo your parentheses. Okay, another analogy here. Let's think of this equation. So here's a built equation for us. And I'm going to ask you to solve this equation. In solving this equation, that means I want to get x completely by itself. How am I going to do that? Well, think of it as a balanced scale. Right now, everything's on the scale, and the scale is absolutely level. Whatever 3x plus 6 is, it is equal to 24. So now we're going to start peeling off the layers. So the first thing I want to peel off is this plus 6. But if it's a balanced scale and I take 6 off, it makes my scale unbalanced. So now we've got to remember that important understanding from Algebra 1 that if I subtract 6 from the left to keep everything equal, I have to also subtract it from the right. In geometry, we call that the equality property of subtraction or addition if it was a negative number. Okay, so once we take our 6 off of both sides, we're keeping our scale very balanced, and now we have 3x plus 8. Now I'm looking at in there, in here, that operation of multiplication that we can't see all the time, but that 3x means that I have 3 times whatever x is. So to undo this, again, I'm going to have to undo and do the opposite operation, which would be divide by 3. But I can't just do it to the left because I would be unbalanced. I have I actually have to do it to the right as well to keep everything balanced. That gives me now x equals 6 when x is, I'll call it a singleton, all by himself, no more numbers left. That gives us what the solution to our equation is. So when we're solving equations, we're looking for that one value or when we get into higher level quadratic equations, we're looking for those two values. Or a cubic will find us three values of what x could be to satisfy that equation. All right, so let's talk about some properties that you've learned in elementary school and you really reinforced these in geometry last year. These are the properties that help us get through these equations. So the first one seems a very simple, the reflexive property. The reflexive property tells us, okay, real simple, a letter A is equal to a letter A, or a variable A is equal to variable A. Well, what does that mean? That means if A is equal to 4, 4 is equal to itself. Now that one seems, well, why do we need that property? Because it is so simple. That property is going to help us when we get down here into the transitive and the substitution property. And we'll talk about that in a minute. Just understand that the reflexive property lets you um, replace values with things that are already equal to themselves. All right, symmetric. Now, you probably studied symmetric property a lot in geometry. This is kind of like the mirror property. Symmetric property says, well, if A is equal to B, then B must be equal to A, all right? So what that one helps us do is that helps us rearrange because sometimes we like those variables on the left-hand side. So an example of that is, well, if 12 is equal to 2A minus 4, then that must mean that 2A minus 4 is equal to 12. That just allows us to switch or flip-flop the left and the right side of the equation, keeping both sides still equal. Now, the transitive property, 
in geometry, this is also known as the law of syllogism. The law of syllogism tells us that if A is equal to B and B is equal to C, then A must have to also be equal to C. Now this is where we're going to use that reflexive property because B has to be equal to itself. So in the transitive property, we're kind of transferring the idea, well, if A is equal to B and B is equal to C, then A must also be equal to C. That's how the transitive property works. So if I have two algebraic expressions for an example of this, maybe I have that 5R plus 9 is equal to 11. And I also know that 11 is equal to 3A plus 1. And I want to solve for A or R or whatever I'm looking for. Then I can set, because these two values are equal, I can set that 5R plus 9 is equal to 3A plus 1. I know I've got different variables in there, just showing you a little bit of a different idea of how that transitive property works. Because the reflexive property says that these two are equal, that must mean that these two equations are equal as well. So our last property that we're going to talk about is the substitution property. So the substitution property property just allows us to replace a simpler version of our variables or our numeric values. So the substitution property says, starts off kind of like the transitive, if A is equal to B, then what I'm allowed to do, then A can replace B in any equation or vice versa. Okay, so how does that work in an equation? So let's start off with an equation that I have 7 plus 2 times x is equal to 27. All right, now instead of having to distribute all of that out, what I can do is I can substitute an equal value here. So 7 plus 2 is also equal to 9, so what I can do is replace that 7 plus 2 by substituting an equal value and making this equation be 9x is equal to 27. So what these properties are going to help us do is it's going to help us allow us to solve these equations by following all of the proper math laws. All right, so let's practice now. We've got two equations. These two are both nice one-step equations. So the first one I have is S minus 5.48 is equal to 0 0.02. One step, nice and easy. I want to undo this subtraction, so I'm going to undo it by its additive inverse, and I'm going to add 5.48. But remembering to keep that scale balance, I have to add 5.48 to both sides. Now this negative 5.8 and that positive 5.48 gives us the identity of 0 and disappears, leaving me with just S on the left-hand side. On the right-hand side, when I add that out, 0 0.02 plus 5.48 gives me 5.5. That is the solution to my equation. Now what's nice about equations are we can always check them. Every equation we do we can always check. So how do I check? I substitute that 5.5 into the original equation. And when I take 5.5 minus 5.48, I am left with 0 0.02, and that checks to verify what I started with. So my solution to this equation will be 5.5. Now if I look at example B. So I got a fraction in there. 
It starts off as 18 is equal to 1 half times t. Now, the operation again, unknown in there, because it's not showing, is going to be multiplication. Now, we typically undo multiplication with division. So for this equation, what I'd like to do is get rid of this 1 half so I can divide it by both sides. Oh, but on that left-hand side, it gives me 18 divided by a half, which is sometimes tricky. So in order to prevent that division by fractions, what I'm going to do is multiply by the reciprocal because that is our rule for dividing by fractions. So instead of using division here, I'm going to multiply both sides by the reciprocal, which would be 2 over 1. So that's going to cancel here, and my t is going to equal 36. Now I can use that symmetric property and clean that up a little bit, and that finds me my solution. Now again, I can check this by plugging that in and understanding that half of 36 is equal to 18. So in my brain there, I did a quick check of this solution. So t does equal 36. All right, our third equation. Now we go into a two-step. So towards the middle of your algebra career, you started looking at two steps. So again, I'm going to look at this equation. I'm going to identify what I have in here. So right inside of here, I have multiplication with the 4 times g, and I have addition. So what I'm going to need to do is get rid of the addition first. So I'm going to subtract 5 from both sides. All right, because I have a fraction here, I'm going to write 5 as a fraction. And remembering that when I subtract fractions, I need a common denominator. So that's going to leave me here with 4g is equal to my common denominator of 9 and 1 would be 9. So I'm going to need to multiply the top and the bottom here by 9. And I'm going to rewrite this as 4 ninths minus 45 ninths. And that's going to give me 4g is equal to negative 41 ninths. All right? A little bit of work on this problem. We're not done. I'm going to rewrite it up here for us. So I have now 4 times g equals negative 41 over 9. I'm going to divide by 4, but because I have that fraction, I think it's going to be easier if I reciprocate it and multiply by 1 fourth, like I did in the last example. And this time, I'm going to end up with g. I don't need common denominators to multiply, so I'm going to multiply straight across because I don't see anything that will simplify. And that leaves me with g is equal to negative 41 over 36. And that is my solution. All right, so our last equation here that we have together is an equation with multiple variables. And you can see I have parentheses in there. You can see I have multiplication, I have addition, I have subtraction. So what I'm going to try to do before I start to solve anything, I'm going to try to simplify this. So in both of these expressions, I'm going to apply the distributive property. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to multiply both of these by 3, leaving me with 3d minus 15. Then I'm going to distribute the negative 6, leaving me with negative 6d minus 48 is 27. All right, now, again, I still got a lot of stuff going on. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to collect my like terms. So I see I have a 3d and a negative 6d. If I simplify that, that gives me negative 3d. And then I have a negative 15 and a negative 48. Combining that gives me 
negative 63 all together gives me 27 and I'm back to having a two-step equation. The two steps being I have multiplication and I have subtraction. So I'm going to go ahead and undo that. So I'm going to undo my last order of operation by adding 63 to both sides. Then I have negative 3d is equal to 9d and I'm going to go ahead and undo the multiplication this time and I'm actually going to divide since I don't have any fractions involved and I'm going to divide by negative 3. That's going to leave me with d is equal to negative 30. And again, if I wanted to check that, I can put negative 30 in for both of these d's and work out this math using my order of operations and I should end up with 27 when I'm done. All right, our last example today that we're gonna do together is all right, well, what if I have a formula? So you will recognize this formula from geometry. This formula finds us the area of a trapezoid. So I have area is equal to 1 half the height of the trapezoid times the sum of the bases. So if you, you're forgetting what a trapezoid looks like, a trapezoid has one set of parallel sides. Those become our bases, base one, base two, and then we have a height to that. There's our height. So what we want to do is we want to take this formula and kind of manipulate it because they're asking us to solve for the height. That means we want to take this formula and solve for h. So here's my original formula. And you can see I have grouping I have addition and I have multiplication. So I don't want to do that addition first because that's involved in my grouping symbols. So I'm going to use my order and understand that multiplication came after my grouping. So I'm going to get rid of it first. So I'm going to go ahead and get rid of that times one half by multiplying by the reciprocal, which would be 2 over 1, to both sides. Now I'm going to rewrite what I have. I have 2 times the area is equal to the height times the sum of the bases. Now, because I'm trying to still get this h by itself, and these two items are bound together by that grouping, I can actually get rid of all of that together by keeping it grouped together. So I was able to manipulate this equation. I'm going to use that symmetric property there and use h is equal to 2 times the area divided by the sum of the bases. And that let me find a formula now for the height of a trapezoid instead of it being in terms of the area. All right, so that's our last example for our first lesson. And these are the problems that I'd like you to try in your textbook. So I'm gonna put that up on Google Classroom for you and let you try those. And then we will talk about those tomorrow. Have a great day.